smooth, shorty, check my swag. My what? My swag. Bitch, you ain't shorty, shorty, just come check my flag. My what? My flag. My swag, if you ain't already know, I stay fresh. So go ahead, let your guard down, show me say yes, cuz. You know the kids so smooth, shorty, check my swag. My what? My all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Yeah, you know who it is, man. It's your boy Darnell. And um, we have another episode of About That Life. Um, this one I'm actually going to have to probably get straight into because this is a, a pretty uh, a pretty lengthy um, kind of complicated uh, subject, so to speak, because we, we know what it is, but at the same time we don't really know what it is. Um, and, um, that topic is going to be sleep. And, uh, I think it's one of those things that, um, we, we know of, but we probably don't know as much as we should. Um, and especially when you start talking about fitness, things like that, uh, you have no idea just how important the sleep is. And if you're not getting it, just how much damage you're probably doing to your body and to yourself so um that's what we're going to get in today obviously we all know we need well hopefully we all know by now that you need sleep if you don't have sleep uh it's not a a a, a, a topic or a question i should say of if you will die it's when and this has been proven there is um i believe an individual you can google it but i believe the longest someone has gone without sleep is something like 11 days or like 14 days something like that that's ridiculous but aside from the point it is possible to go a long time without sleep but your body takes a big hit uh, when you don't get enough of it as well as the correct type uh, so what is sleep um, and the best way to well the, the the most common definition I should say is it's an altered state of consciousness um, and keep in mind, that's not to say you're unconscious when you're asleep. You're very much the opposite. Your brain is actually very, very active uh, while you're asleep. It's just doing other things. You know, so usually sleep is characteristic of, you know, your eyes being closed, your body being in a state of relaxation, uh, your brain being in that altered subconscious mindset, uh, and it's accompanied by a lot of different, uh, a lot of different processes that the body chooses to process at that time, considering that it's not in the middle of, of doing like your, your everyday task. It has time to actually carry these things out in detail and it does a pretty good job, uh, if you get the correct amount of sleep. But with that said, um, there's actually four different stages of sleep. Uh, so it's not just sleep or not sleep. There's four different stages. Um, in between those four, three of them are considered non-REM, and then there's one that's considered REM. Uh, and REM stands for Rapid Eye Movement. Uh, and we'll get into exactly what that is. But the first stage of sleep, needless to say, is the, the most basic level of sleep there is, and that's called N1, which is non-rapid eye movement. And that'd be N1 in its light sleep. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, when you start to, let's say you doze off, then your, you know, your brain waves start to change, your eye movement slows down, your breathing pattern begins to kind of stabilize and regulate a little bit. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty quick, uh, it's a pretty quick stage overall. And it's not something that, um, that you'd be very difficult to wake up from. Uh, so if, you know, somebody probably jostled you the wrong way, you probably wake up. Uh, but that is the purpose of light sleep. It's exactly that. It's light sleep. Uh, so that, that's a very brief stage, uh, that we go through. Uh, stage two, which is the more common, like when you think about sleep, that's more, the, the more common interpretation would be deep sleep, uh, or N2. Uh, and that one, even though it is, you know, it's not quite like deep, deep sleep, it's still deeper than light sleep. Um, and that one is, um, you know, you, you get the same muscle jerks and reactions that you get in light sleep, but your brain waves then change again in order to maintain the sleep. 
Um, so during that, it would be more of a more of a task to wake you up, and that's when your body, well, you, when your brain starts to switch over to understanding that okay, the body is asleep. So what I need to do is try to still protect myself, but also allow myself to rest. So your brain will start to interpret the things that are going on around you and determine whether or not it's something that it should wake you up for, or if it's something that you should stay asleep through. Um, <clears throat> moving on from there, you move to stage three, uh, which is considered slow wave sleep and is the last stage before REM sleep, and that's deep, deep sleep so that's when you're considered like knocked out um, <clears throat> that one is when you start um, something called delta waves um, and it's slow brain waves and your body is consciously well your I should say your mind is consciously attempting to keep your body uh, in a relaxed state um, and the things that that you know like would normally wake you up your mind is going to really really question whether or not it's something that's worth waking you up for and more than likely your brain's probably just going to keep you asleep. So that that's a, a very very good uh, level of sleep and levels three and four uh, like this level three in, in three and the REM sleep are the best the best stages uh, where your your body does its its best work. Um, and then moving over we're gonna say stage four which is considered rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, this is ideally <clears throat> where you're at when your body begins to dream. Uh, well, not when, you're, when your muscles are paralyzed and when your mind begins to dream. Uh, now, muscle uh, paralysis is very disconcerting. I, I will say that. I'll be very honest about that. It actually happened to me um, yesterday, actually, now that I think about it, yeah. Um, so it's very, very, very fresh in my mind and it's kind of a jostling experience and what it is, your mind paralyzes your muscles so you don't accidentally act out anything in your dream and you don't like hurt yourself or anything, but sometimes you can like become awake before you go into REM sleep. I'm like, shit, what the hell is going on here? And then I thought about it like, oh, damn it. I got caught in between the stages, so now I can't move. And <laughs> I'm trying like hell to move, and I cannot move. I was trying to like push my, my stomach out so my hands would move, or they would fall off the couch so I would wake up. And eventually it did work, but it's a really uncomfortable one. It, I hate that shit, that's all I'm gonna say. But muscle paralysis is real. Uh, but your mind is extremely active during REM sleep, um, and that's when you're um, you're doing. I mean, your your brain is um, your brain is actively like cleaning itself, and I'm gonna get into that uh, and rearranging um, your heart rate, your blood pressure increases, um, your breathing is a little more a little a little less stable, I should say. Uh, but it's probably the most, probably the most restorative sleep that you're going to get. Um, uh, now in terms of time, because I'm sure everyone's heard of, oh, okay, well, you know, you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep. Why eight hours of sleep? Well, each one of those stages, there's four stages, each stage you go through per night about four to five times. And each one of those stages is about 90 minutes. So you figure that works out to eh, somewhere roughly around seven and a half hours if you count out the uh, the four to five times. So that's why people say, well, I should say scientists say you need to get seven to eight hours of sleep so you complete the entire cycle, um, which is unfortunately not really what we end up doing. Which that's that's a whole another that's a whole another topic altogether. Um, either way. Um, your sleep cycle, and there is actually a, a thing that controls it in your body, it's, it's your sleep weight cycle, it's controlled by something called the circadian rhythm, uh, and this is your biological clock essentially, and it controls your body temperature, hormonal production, um, as it pertains to the sleep weight cycle, specifically the two hormones that either wake you up or 
put you to sleep. Uh, the wake up hormone, which is what we're going to get into next, um, that one is kind of a stress hormone. And then the other hormone is basically designed just to knock you out. That's about it. But um, your circadian rhythm is primarily controlled by light. Uh, I mean, granted, there's other environmental factors that can affect it, but primarily it's going to be light. Uh, and basically what happens here, the light travels into your eyes, down your optic nerve, uh, from your optic nerve into your hypothalamus, um, and then from your hypothalamus into this, like this little cluster of neutrons or brain uh, neurons, I should say, or brain cells, and um, it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, and at that point, it gets, you know, it it, uh, it kind of uh, it gets processed, and your body decides what hormone it should be releasing. Um, and that's one of the main reasons you get something called jet lag. So your body is expecting to be up for a certain amount of time. It's expecting to have light for a certain amount of time while it's up. So if you went to somewhere like, let's say, Hawaii, and it's like five hours behind here, like right now it would be like midday. And um, like let's say let let's say you live in New York, and let's say it's 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 let's say it's ten o'clock at night. Uh, so at ten o'clock at night, needs to say it's very very dark. Um, it's it's night. Uh, if you were in Hawaii, though, it would only be five, so you'd still be in the evening. So you would have additional light that your body wasn't really preparing for, and that's where jet lag comes in, where your body is really ready to go to sleep but because you're in a different place because the light is different it doesn't uh, but that that's primarily why it happens um, in terms of how you traditionally go to sleep uh, most people know about how we produce energy or how we produce um, <clears throat> how we produce um, our or how we convert sugars into a into a way that we can maintain our energy levels and um it's through something called glycolysis um and it's basically it converts glucose which is the most simple sugar that our body uses into something called pyruvate um and that energy that's produced during glycolysis um it's used to form something called adenosine triphosphate uh which is essentially what powers our bodies um, I mean, that's a whole different topic altogether, but the adenosine triphosphate, uh, of course, has adenosine as a byproduct. Uh, and this adenosine has receptors in the brain, well, really all over your body, your heart, kidneys, things like that. But uh, those adenosine receptors will basically, it'll receive the adenosine, and then that tells your brain that, okay, we've used a lot of energy today. Uh, it's time to rest, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us, uh, a lot of us drink caffeinated beverages. Those those caffeine uh, molecules happen to look very, very similar to the adenosine molecules. But what will happen? The caffeine molecules can actually bond with the adenosine receptors, and then it tricks your body into thinking that you're not actually tired, which is why you get like that that boost of energy real quick um, and then maybe three four or five hours later it wears off and now you're a little bit more tired uh, but either way the adenosine helps trigger your need to, to rest uh, now in terms of the awake hormone like I said there's two uh, the first one is called cortisol uh, <laughs> I know some people automatically are you know pulling out their their pitchforks and and getting their um, getting their shotguns ready when I said that Cortisol is not that bad of a hormone, believe it or not. It's a very, very, it's a very useful hormone, and it's necessary for us to live, and it's necessary for us to, it's necessary for us to operate in the way that we do. It's just because of our conditions and because of the way life is now, we end up having more of it produced than we should. But either way, uh, cortisol is is considered a stress hormone. Uh, it's linked to your fight or flight response, which is, I mean, I would hope most people know what the fight or flight response is, but it basically preps your body to deal with whatever threat is imminent at that point. And the way it does this, it dumps sugar in your uh, in your bloodstream. 
Uh, so it, it regulates your blood sugar as well as your metabolism by a, um, by a uh, default and it keeps you going. Uh, and in terms of metabolism, just so we're all on the same page, your metabolism is either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be anabolic, which is building up, or catabolic, which is breaking down. Um, so if anybody is aware of like Louis Marco, it's the L-U-I, and he says anabolic chicken. Like, <laughs> that's what he's talking about, like chicken that's building your body up. I mean, granted, that chicken might be spiked with something, but I'm not going to get into that. Either way, though, um, you have something called uh, glycolysis, which, again, it breaks down the glucose in the pyruvate, which is necessary to produce ATP. Um, the glucose that you have in your system is then used, and then usually there is an insulin response triggered, which then stores the rest of the um, stores the rest of the sugar. Now, when you're stressed out, and let's say you don't, you know, actually have any sugar in your system, then the next best thing is glycogen, uh, which is basically a stored uh, a stored product of glucose. But there's a process called gluconeogenesis, which is going to free up that glycogen via lactic acid, amino acids, and glycerol, which is fat, of course. Uh, and then it's going to put more glucose in the blood so you can do whatever you need to do and then go from there. Uh, now, the problem, though, is when you don't sleep enough, your body has issues metabolizing the glucose. Uh, so what's going to happen here is you're going to have some insul uh, insulin sensitivity issues. Uh, so ideally, your pancreas creates insulin after you eat. Uh, so let's say you eat something and now you have sugar flowing through your system. Uh, through a process called glycogenesis, it's going to store that sugar from your foods and either your muscles or your adipose tissue, which is basically fat, uh, for use as glycogen. And then when you need that, that sugar reserve, then that's when you have gluconeogenesis, which frees up the glycogen, converts it back to glucose. So it's kind of a give and a take. Uh, you'll learn with uh, a lot of biology, things that end in lysis traditionally mean to break down. Uh, things that end in genesis usually mean to start. Uh, so that's a that, that's a good way to um, that's a good way to kind of think of things. So if you hear lysis, just figure that you're breaking something down. Like during stage three and four uh, sleep, your metabolism is least active. Uh, and it's considered during that time that your your brain and your body in general is able to, you know, kind of repair itself uh, during those times. And let's say that you're not really sleeping correctly and you're not giving yourself the opportunity to essentially repair the natural damages and wear and tear that happens with your body. Needless to say, that's going to cause some issues. That That's kind of... That's kind of a, a no-brainer, so to speak. Uh, additionally, the sleep is helpful for controlling uh, not only your appetite, but also your, uh, your insulin sensitivity. So when you, let's say you don't sleep enough, well, let's say you do sleep enough. Uh, like I was saying, glucose in the bloodstream, in the bloodstream insulin, um, insulin either... Goes, it, insulin goes through glycogenesis, stores the sugar in the muscles and the adipose tissue as glycogen, and then your sugar is regulated. Good to go, right? When you don't sleep enough, additionally, there's no insulin signal that's sent in most cases. Um, and the problem with that, needless to say, is now you have a ton of glucose flowing through your system. Um, and your blood sugar is going to be very high. Needless to say, that can lead to diabetes, uh, specifically type 2 diabetes. I really shouldn't have to get into why diabetes is a bad thing. You don't want that. that that's all you need to know. You don't want to be a diabetic. Um, but that's traditionally what's going on when you have diabetes. Your body isn't able to regulate the sugar in your bloodstream, and it builds up and it causes problems. Um, additionally, like I was saying, with your appetite control, uh, let's say you don't sleep, there's two hormones that get affected. 
Leptin, which is produced by adipose tissue, reduces your appetite, and as a result, it increases your energy usage, uh, which is good. Um, and then also on the other end, which is equally good, you have ghrelin, which is produced by the stomach, that increases your appetite, but it reduces your energy usage. So just to cover, leptin reduces appetite, ghrelin increases your appetite, leptin increases energy usage, ghrelin reduces energy usage. Uh, so when you don't sleep enough, your leptin levels get lower and your ghrelin levels get higher. Um, as a result, you want to eat more and traditionally we are going to crave carbohydrates more than anything because they're, they contain energy. Uh, and again, ghrelin reduces your energy usage. So because your energy usage in your body is lower, you're going to crave the carbohydrates to boost your energy, but you already have energy sources to use within your body that your body's not taking advantage of. And as a result, it's going to store that sugar, it's going to store that energy in more adipose tissue or as triglycerides or fat which is, that's usually not a good thing. So because you're producing so much hormone, you're gonna, I mean, you could potentially get adrenal fatigue syndrome. Um, with that, you're gonna have lower body temperature, lower blood sugar, which are things that cortisol would, you know, would deal with. Uh, you're gonna have a lack of energy, um, you know, your stress is gonna be more difficult to deal with. Um, you're probably gonna be dealing with some level of depression, uh, all in all, it's going to lower your mood and it's going gonna, it's gonna to put you in a, a worse place mentally, uh, which needless to say, that's not a good thing. With that said, does this now mean that we should be getting rid of cortisol or, you know, fighting against cortisol? No, not at all. Cortisol, again, is needed to put sugar in your bloodstream. It's, it's not a bad thing at all. It's just too much of anything can be bad that's that's the takeaway here so you don't want your cortisol overworking more than it needs to uh, which brings me to the second hormone which is melatonin and because cortisol of course is the hormone to keep you up uh, melatonin is the one to put you to sleep uh, and the way your sleep cycle should look when you first wake up there should be, boom, big boost of, of sugar. It's your body preparing to get ready for the day, and it wakes itself up. So that first hour after you, eat, uh, after you wake up, you're going to get a huge boost of energy. And at that point, that's the cortisol doing what it's supposed to do. Now, your cortisol is supposed to look like a valley. So at the beginning of the day, it's going to be very, very high. And as the day goes on, it should, in theory start to start ramping down. It's going to ramp down, ramp down. And then around midday, melatonin is going to kick in, and melatonin is going to slowly start increasing, start increasing, start increasing, and then it's going to peak around your nighttime hours. So it's supposed to be a very rhythmic curve, and it's supposed to feel very natural when you sleep correctly. But sleep is fantastic, and when melatonin puts you to sleep, um, and you get like good REM sleep, like that stage three and stage four, like deep sleep and REM sleep, you get a lot of anabolic hormones that are produced during that time, uh, like testosterone, IGF-1, growth hormone. These are fantastic things to have going through your body. Additionally, you have muscle tissue synthesis, you have protein synthesis, you have tissue repair, like I was saying. Additionally, you have uh, this, other, uh, this other stuff in your brain called CSF, and it's uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, it's produced by your choroid plexuses, uh, but while you're sleeping, this stuff aids in basically cleaning your brain, and it removes a lot of waste, in, uh, waste molecules, uh, and it gives a pathway for the drainage. Um, additionally, it can aid in regulating your cerebral blood flow. Uh, which will clear out deoxygenated blood and then uh, also protects it from impact. So this CSF fluid is good stuff. Uh, but when you don't sleep enough, you don't have the same stage sleep. Uh, actually, I should have went over this before, but your sleep stages don't always go in order. 
So, yeah, even though you got one, two, three, and four, that doesn't mean it's going to go one, two, three, four. Uh, and scientists have actually shown that it's traditionally, it might go from one to two to three to four, and then from four back to one, and then from one to three, and then maybe from three to two, and then from two to four. It jumps around. But either way, your brain is regulating what stage it needs to be in, and when it's in the correct stages, it releases a ton of good things for your body to help you reorganize and get prepared for the next day. In addition to reorganizing, scientists actually believe that your memories, things like that, are recategorized and your brain, in, in theory, is organized during sleep. Uh, and needless to say, because this is a fitness uh, sort of channel and the thing that we're discussing are the fitness benefits, having testosterone, IGF, and uh, growth hormone, as well as the, the protein synthesis and muscle tissue synthesis and repair, that's obviously a very, very good thing. But that really doesn't occur until the stage three and stage four. So if you're not sleeping correctly you're not going to see the same recovery from your workouts that you normally see. So you're doing a lot of work, but you're not giving your body a chance to properly heal and build back bigger, better, stronger uh, the way you'd want. So it kind of ends up being a waste of time almost. So if you don't sleep for the eight hours and you're only sleeping for, let's say, like four or five, then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. That sucks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, <clears throat> another one of the things that's kind of uh, affecting us so much uh, as a general population when it comes to sleep, because this, this is an epidemic. I mean, there's millions of people diagnosed with uh, insomnia every year. Um, I mean, most people know what insomnia is, but they don't know just how damaging it is when you don't sleep good. And a lot of us just kind of take it for granted that you go to sleep and you stay asleep. Most people don't do that. And then there's even sleep apnea, uh, where your body is having difficulty breathing. Uh, and sometimes it might jolt you awake because you're, you know, your airway is blocked or something. Uh, and then there's different treatments or face masks and whatnot that you can wear to kind of remedy that. But all of these things are affecting the quality of your sleep. And considering we want gains and we want the most high quality gains we can get, the more that you can regulate and control your sleep cycle, the more likely you're going to get good, good, consistent, noticeable improvement in your body and its function overall. So I can't even say that it's just a fitness thing when it comes to sleep. It's your body's, it's your body's performance overall, seriously. Like your, like how your body works as a as a whole, is affected by sleep, and it, it's so important. And I tell so many people that I work with, hey, are you getting proper sleep? Another thing, though, um, is the electronic age. Uh, you know, this is 2017. There's seven billion people on the planet. There's about six billion devices. Uh, those devices emit light, blue light, and again. Light affects your circadian rhythm. So take a wild guess what all these screens and TVs and tablets and cell phones and computers are doing to us considering a lot of us are up at night on those screens. Those screens produce a shit ton of blue light. And blue light is one of the most, it's one of the most powerful light spectrums there is. You have uh, ultraviolet, which is very, uh, which is very strong, but it's not something we can really see. Blue light is something that we can see, um, but it's it could be extremely, extremely harmful to us. Uh, and not to say that it's one of those things that we that we shouldn't have. No, it's it's extremely, extremely uh, important. Regulate our um, our circadian rhythm for the most part, but let's say. When you're on your phone at night and you're staring into that screen and you don't have any sort of blue light filter or anything. Actually, this is good for those that don't know why a blue light filter is so important at night. You're doing a ton of damage to yourself. Uh, not only is it bad for your sleep patterns, but, and, and this is proven, so I'm not even just making this up. It can actually contribute to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, 
depression. These are these are all things. I mean, now, even though, like I said, during the day, it's good to have the the blue light because it you know it's gonna boost your your ability to to pay attention to things or it's gonna make your mood better. At night, it is unbelievably disruptive, and it does a ton of damage. Um, and it'll throw your, your circadian rhythm off very, very, very badly. Um, now what you want to do, ideally, I know it's impossible now that, you know, you, you, you go to bed on time because a lot of us work weird hours. You just have to know that you have to protect yourself from the blue light. And at night, your body is not supposed to have that much blue light naturally. And because these screens, these electronic screens, produce so much of it, it, it just wreaks havoc on our systems. And a lot of people that aren't able to sleep at night, they're not able to sleep probably because they're staring at their phone before they go to sleep or they're watching TV right before they go to sleep. And if you think, again, about how that blue light works and how your suprachiasmatic nucleus is interpreting that, when you're getting that blue light, that's telling your body, oh, okay, I need to produce more cortisol, I need to dump more glucose in the system because we're still woke, even though you're trying to go to sleep. So your body is literally producing the exact opposite of the hormone that you need to go to sleep. You need melatonin. You don't want your body producing cortisol right before you go to bed. Additionally, we are stressed out as a people. There's bills, you have, you know, you have mortgages, rents. Uh, you have kids, jobs, all sorts of different stressful factors. And those stressful factors lead us to overproduce cortisol in, in record amounts. And some of us never have an opportunity to just shut down and just relax. And as a result, you have cortisol being produced around the clock. So you don't have that nice, that nice valley graph where things are kind of going up and then they kind of slow down and kind of mellow out over time <clears throat> it's just up 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 constantly 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 active and that's where the adrenal fatigue comes in um so how do you fix that well number one you're gonna have to reprogram your circadian rhythm and the best way to do that start blocking out the the blue light at night so i know i usually go to bed around the same time so thankfully I've been blessed and I have a smart TV and I've put an app on the TV called Twilight, which automatically will switch off the, um, it'll switch off the, the blue lights uh, and it'll switch it to kind of like a red hue. Uh, I mean, is red, you know, still light? Yes, it's still light, but it's not as strong as the blue light, so <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit warmer and it's, in theory, it shouldn't affect your sleep cycle you know, is bad. It, it it should, in theory, have the least capability to change your circadian rhythm or or, or reduce or um, reduce or suppress your melatonin secretion. Uh, so you can start using those those filters earlier, um, or you know, number one, you want to have some sort of filter after you have your filter set up. And I, like I said, I have Twilight on the TV, I have a blue light filter on my phone, and I have uh, Flux. Um, I'll, put a, um, I'll put a link in the description about what Flux is, uh, but it automatically adjusts the light levels on both of my computers. So basically at night before I go to sleep, I don't have any strong red lights, uh, excuse me, any strong blue lights or any like really strong lights in the home. I can go to bed pretty easily. Um, and then I have special uh, night lights, uh, night light uh, uh, outlets that have like a, a different sort of, um, a different sort of uh, light technology. Um, so the, um, <clears throat> they're, they're not like fluorescent light bulbs or LEDs. Those LEDs actually produce more blue light too. Uh, but they're designed a little bit differently. Um, I wish I remember what sort of outlets they were, but I put them in such a long time ago, I'd have to, like, try to find a box or take the thing apart or something. But there are outlets that, you know, they produce, like, a different amount of uh, of, uh, of blue light or a reduced amount. Uh, so let's say you're at night, you don't have that, that light kind of hit you and start 
throwing your rhythm off naturally. Uh, and then there's also goggles if, you know, push comes to, sl- uh, comes to shove. And you can wear these goggles and it'll effectively block out the blue light. Uh, so you're not, like, you know, you're not getting overwhelmed with a bunch of blue light right before you go to bed. Uh, but in time, you can actually change your circadian rhythm and you can switch it back to a healthy pattern. Uh, where you go to sleep when you're supposed to, and you're up when you're supposed to. Uh, again, it's not something that is going to be like an immediate or even a possible thing for some of us. And I understand that. You know, and the people that I work with, you know, I let them know I'm fully aware that your schedule and your job and different commitments like that, you know, they are going to affect the amount of time that you spend in front of a computer. Um, I mean, I believe it's speculated that we spend something like six hours out of a day staring at some sort of screen. I mean, that's, needless to say, not um, not too great. You know, that's not what we were designed to do is sit in front of computer screens. But we do, and that's understandable. All I'm saying is just be aware that s- spending that much time in front of a screen or... You know, spending that much time in front of any screen, if even if it's just a phone, it is going to have some health impacts. And especially if you're about that life and you're trying to get gains and you're trying to, to put a body together, you definitely don't want the easiest way for you to, you know, for you to bulk up and rebuild quickly, which is by sleeping like a boss. You don't want that to get taken away from you because you're staying up with a bunch of lights the people that work overnight (laughs) I mean you know I mean what can I say that's probably not great (laughs) you know I'm I'm, I'm not gonna lie that's definitely probably the worst you can do but again life life is life and you have to do what you have to do to support your family Um, so I just ask people hey if you do need to be up during that time at least make sure that you're getting eight hours. So even if you're not, you know, you're 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 up when you're supposed to actually be asleep, just make sure that you're getting a solid eight hours at least. I mean, granted, yes, day sleep is way worse than night sleep, but sleep of, you know, at least if you do the eight hours of sleep and you get an opportunity to go through all the different stages of sleep, you have a better chance of being able to to recover from it and not have it make a huge impact on you but if you're one of those people that you're working a night shift and you only sleep a couple hours during the day you are quite literally killing yourself and you know if you're putting on weight and you don't know why you're putting on weight that's one of the reasons why you're not giving your body a chance to wind down clear itself out rebuild and then come back bigger better stronger the next day it, there's just no way around it. You have to give your chance a, you have to give yourself a chance to rebuild and heal. And if you're not, you're never going to see any gains. You're never going to see any increases. And if you do, it's going to take a hell of a lot longer than those people that are sleeping correctly and those people that are taking this particular topic very serious. That's a easy, foolproof way to protect your body and have it heal itself and take advantage of all the natural things that your body is able to do on its own. I mean, don't make it more difficult on yourself. Like, give yourself the opportunity to succeed. And one of the easiest ways, get a good eight hours of sleep. Um, But with that said, I'm not going to make this go any longer than than it has to. I'm going to try to cut this now. But I just wanted to kind of explain the importance of... um, the importance of sleep and why it's something that more people should be taking seriously and something that, um, you know, something that we kind of overlook very often and something that should not be. Um, So once again, of course, if you have any questions or anything, drop them down below or if you believe I missed something or if you have, you know, like a tip or whatever the case is, you know, just drop your comment down below. Um, And if you want to Keep up with uh, the episodes in the future. I would recommend, you know, throw a subscribe on it. If um, you know, if this taught you something or you learned something, you can like it. Um, if you just think you already knew, then 
congratulations on being a boss and knowing how to get the most out of your workout and knowing how to get the most out of your body. Uh, that is impressive. Um, but uh, in the interim, I am going to go and hit some legs today. Um, and then, um, you know, our next... Um, our next um our next episode will likely be uh probably on food or something um i mean there's a few different episodes that i was uh looking at but uh, i figured i wanted to get this one out the way because i know this would be a big topic so uh for right now though uh, like i said i gotta go get these legs so uh i will check in with peeps in the near future and for right now i'm gonna go ahead and sign off and check y'all later all right peace